Hello, Bill Villapiano, pastor of Faith Fellowship. We're delighted that you've chose to be with us for a Sunday morning service here on our Facebook live stream. Just a few things that I'd like to share with you before we go to our live service. First of all, before you leave the page today, would you like or follow our Facebook page? I also like to share with people, it helps us to be able to spread the message if you will let us know that you're there, if you will like it or love it, and then if you will share it on your page. We often hear from people who have either received help, encouragement, and we often hear about people giving their hearts to Christ as a result of somebody sharing it to their Facebook page. So if you do that, we would appreciate it so much. Another thing you can do on our Facebook page, if you have a prayer request, please send us your prayer request. We are glad to pray and agree with you concerning your circumstances. Now, a third thing that I'd like to talk about before we go to the live message is that we would like to talk about giving. Now, first of all, I want you to know that if you attend another local church and you're just with us for whatever reason this Sunday morning, or you are for a few Sundays, we believe that your tithe and your offering should go to your local church. So we're not asking anybody that has another home church to do any giving here. If you're a first time guest on this live stream, please do not be turned off by the offering. It's just necessary for us to do these things in speaking to people who are with us regularly. You're our guest this morning, feel no obligation to give. But then there are those who have still not made it back since COVID. And the easiest way to continue to support the church is to text to give. Second of all, over these months, we have developed an audience of people who aren't attending church anywhere. And if you would like to support us, the easiest way to do that is to text to give. You can dial this number on your phone, text 417-203-4888. And you can just follow the directions on the screen and fill out what amount of money that you might would be tithing or just giving this particular Sunday. Listen, we appreciate people's support. This just helps us to do the many things that we are doing. There is no expense to being online. We're not telling you you're supporting the broadcast. It helps us to take care of youth and children in the facilities. You're giving, once again, could be a blessing to us. But we want you to know, regardless whether you give or not, we are delighted that you've chose to worship with us this morning. So now we're going to go to the live stream. And again, thank you. And uh, a lot of good things happening, and we're real grateful for that. Thank you, Lord God. I want to thank once again uh, Leon and Jeff for filling the uh, pulpit for us while we was gone. We had a great time with our family. Uh, we went to Florida so we could cool off. Yeah, yeah. It was about eight degrees cooler. And, uh, yeah. Uh, we, we, got, we got on the plane at, at 82 degrees in Jacksonville, and we landed in St. Louis at 100. So anyway, but of course it warmed up there through the day too. Thank you, Lord. But we're glad to be back. Always, always thrilled to be home and, and um, uh, just grateful we've got a good church family, takes care of things uh, in our absence. You know, we go see, try to see our kids a little bit more often, you know, that, gosh, I, I probably went 10, 15 year, years and probably didn't miss three services and uh, now, because we've got grandkids kind of scattered out, they're growing up. Uh, our grandson in Florida, he will be 16 in September. And uh, so, you know, we try to get down there because, you, you, know, you know, it's just real. The older they get, the less time they spend with you. And uh, you know, because they got other things, they got other interests, they'll have jobs. They, you know, so we've tried to maximize these years. And, and uh, again, grateful for a good church family. Listen, we're going to start a, a new series uh, uh, this morning. And, uh, you know, uh, we're calling this, uh, uh, you know, even strong people need help. And uh, let me pray and we're going to start. Leon, if you'll turn on them side lights. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to share your word, to teach and to preach your gospel. How grateful we are to know that your word's good seed when it's sown on good ground in our lives that it'll produce good fruit. And we thank you for these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. You know, we talk about, uh, once again, the fact that uh, everyone needs help. 
Uh, young people need help. Older people need help. Obviously, those that are weak are in need of help. But then again, also, people who are strong need help. And we think about help and, we, and, and to ask for help some, uh, sometime or to ask for prayer uh, or, 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 to, or, or to think or share with somebody that you need somebody to come alongside of you. You know, I believe that many times it makes us feel exposed. It makes us feel vulnerable. We, we often hate for somebody to see beyond, and I'm, I'll say it graciously, sometimes but beyond the public facade that we, we sometimes portray. And, and listen, I'm, I, I, have, I have that as much as, as anybody else does. Uh, so there is a need. Once again, a need, uh, a need for help is this. It's not a sign of weakness. It's not a sign of vulnerability. It's this. The need for help is God's design. Look at this verse. We're going to start in Genesis 2.18. And, and, and I can, we, we, will, we'll, we will draw precedent throughout the scripture and, and make the case. You know, a lot of times when we're preaching, this is, uh, you know, this is my philosophy for preaching. What we're doing is we're pleading a case. And if, you, and if you plead your case well enough, like you was in a court of law, that when you would, at the end of it, uh, you would have made your case, that it would have been convincing. And so we're going to look at the scripture in that manner. Genesis 2.18 says, And the Lord God said, He said, It's not good that man should be alone. Now we know in this, in this case, He's talking about man and woman. You could say that He's talking about husband and wife. But we'll make the case this morning that He's not just talking about that. Though certainly if I was talking about marriage, I, I could do that. But you know, what about the person who's single? You think God just forgot about them? Obviously not. So the truth is, whether you're married or not married, and there's a lot of married people that are still living alone, it's not good that a man should be alone. We've underlined that it's not good. It's not right. It's not beneficial that we should in life be alone. Listen to the Amplified Bible this morning. It says, now the Lord God said it's not good. Or, now catch this. I really like it. It is not sufficient. It's not sufficient. It's not satisfactory to be alone. You know, it's not like God created us with a deficit. He, he had a design. And his design was this, is that man wouldn't always live and walk alone. The man would have a community. That there would be others that would gather around them. In another message, we'll talk about the one another's in the scripture. So he says this, it is not sufficient. It's, what, it's not enough. It's not enough. All by myself, it's not enough. Amplified Bible also says this, it's not satisfactory that man should be what? Alone. And he says this, and I'll make him what? A helper. Everybody needs help. Men need help. Women need help. The senior citizen needs help. The young person needs help. The wise need help. The weak need help. Everybody needs help. See, if you again, I, I will make this statement once again. If you reduce this down to just marriage, then we would just be leaving people with the thought, well, then it's just not good to be single. And then Paul missed it. No, it's not, it's not good to be alone. We all need help in our lives. No one is this. No one is sufficient in and of themselves. Nobody. So we need people around about us. Boy, I know this. I'm, I'm, I'm a fortunate guy. Uh, I pastor a good church. You know, where uh, next week we will have uh, 
uh, for those that are guests, this is our 40th year of ministry. And so throughout the year, we're celebrating different things. And next week, again, we're inviting young people. And, and now I say they're young people, they're adults. They got kids. And, uh, and they'll be coming in, you know, from, you know, from, you know, di- you know different parts of the country. And, and uh, we'll, be, we'll be real grateful. But on the platform will be four, th- four youth ministers. All four of those youth ministers are still with us today. Isn't that a good report? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Give the Lord a hand. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you talk about where, you know, you, you know that uh, uh, you often hear the term James, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're better together. Uh, uh, now, there, uh, our, our children's church, uh, uh, Dennis and Selena, are down in Arkansas seeing their, uh, seeing their son today. But, you know, uh, when it comes to children's curriculum, Selena's a professional. I'm telling you, she knows more about that than anybody else I know. I, so we, we need one another. You will you always appreciate the bulletin and the powerpoints, and if and if Peggy didn't look at them, <laughs> you would be embarrassed for me. No, she'll tell you I've gotten better, but it still needs help. My point is nobody is sufficient by themselves. You know, as a young man, James, I tried to do everything. I did the bulletin. Was it pathetic? I, you know, I did the bulletin. I put the cards in the pews. I vacuumed the sanctuary. I mean, the list goes on. And you know, and, right, and, and early on, there were some things that I could do better than I could get somebody else to do. But you know what? Once they got to doing it, then they could do it better. We're all better together. We, everybody needs help. Everybody needs help. Sometimes we need help in our family. Sometimes we need help at work. Sometimes we need help with our children. Sometimes we need help spiritually. Nobody is sufficient in and of themselves. Now see, when God created us, remember, there's a design. The design is that we would have to need somebody. He created this that way. You would have to need somebody. Independence is not an attitude or an environment that God approves of. That's always because somebody was thinking something bad. Yeah, independence is not an attitude or an environment that God approves of. But we're proud of it. And where's pride come in? Just before what? Thank you. Just before the fall. Independence is not an attitude or an environment that God approves of. John 15, 5, he says this. Now we're talking about Jesus. Even Jesus wasn't independent. Even he wasn't sufficient in and of himself. He says, he says I, I, I'm the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bear much fruit. He says this, though. For without me, you can do what? First of all, what do we need? We need God. We need God in our lives. He says this, Jesus gave them the answer. I tell you the truth. All right? If you're reading a King James Bible, this is where it says verily, verily. Verily, verily means this is the truth and nothing but the truth, so help me God. It's almost like swearing your way into court. Here's the truth. The son can do nothing by himself. Yet there are many believers who think they can do it by themselves. I always think the Bible's good news, and it's always good news that you don't have to what? Walk alone. I go back to Genesis, the second chapter, and verse 18. Now it says, now the Lord God said it's not good. It's, again, it's not sufficient. It's not sufficient. Doesn't mean you're lost. Doesn't mean you're not a Christian. Doesn't mean that you don't believe in God. But he says this, it's not sufficient. It's not satisfactory that man should be what? Alone. And I will make him a helper. Now look at this. 
that's suitable, adapted, somebody that compliments him. See, help comes this way. Everybody's heard the story about the storm. You know, it's, it's not a real story. You know, it's one of them internet stories. It's hypothetical. Oh, a storm came. Man finds himself, you know, and it's, 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 the flooding is everywhere. And he's climbed up in a tree and he's hanging on. And the water's continuing to rise and a guy comes by in a boat. And the man in the boat says, get in the boat. He says, I'm believing God. Now that's just a story, you know. But that's, that's not a, it's not a stretch. It's not a stretch. God sends what? He sends help. Help that, what? help that will compliment you. See, in a marriage relationship, men and women, they're not the same. Don't you thank God for that? It's a compliment. It's a compliment. You know how some guys joke about, you know, that, you, you know, uh, I am the guy when he's driving that needs help with directions. I'm not saying I'm a bad driver. I'm saying I'm not, not good with directions. June is. We compliment each other. Uh, I, you know, I can be just a little hard sometimes, I, though I've softened as I've gotten older. But June compliments that. She compliments it. June would give everything away. I try to save something. We compliment each other. That's not an insult. That's, that's a compliment about my wife. She's very giving. We compliment. But the same thing is true in life and who you walk with. And here's a little wisdom. Walk with people that compliment you. Walk with people that compliment you. Yeah. We was in prayer this morning. We had Miss Linda pray. I'm intimidated now. She's so nice when she prays. I don't know if God will ever listen to me now. I'm kidding. But she is a very kind person. She compliments Leon. You know, I knew that would go that way, and I think it's funny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you guys know them, if you know them well enough, it's still funny, though, that you know, Leon is very kind, too. Amen. But on the other hand, I know them very well, and Leon compliments Miss Linda. But we need friends that what? That compliment us. We need relationships that compliment us. We need people we walk to to compliment and somebody that what? That suits us. Someone that suits us. We used to have a guy in our church who was a traveling evangelist. Bill's still alive. He's, he's, he's 90. He just turned 90. And uh, a matter of fact, his daughter will be here next week for a youth event. And Bill, Bill's just a great guy. He's a very good teacher. He, uh, yes, he was in the ministry for, forever. Matter of fact, he still teaches in a Bible school at 90 years old. He's still teaching. And, uh, but now Bill couldn't put, a, he could not put a suit together for anything. First of all, Bill was a little colorblind. Second of all, he just really didn't care all that much. I mean, you could get plaid pants and a plaid jacket and them not be in the same color. And not be a complimentary color either. So when he would get ready to go, Joe, his wife, Joanne was her name. We all called her Joe. She would pack and she would put the shirt with the pants, with the jacket, and with the tie. Joe hated to go somewhere and be embarrassed when she traveled with him. He needed what her to compliment him. Now, once again, now Bill was a great teacher. Does it make any difference what you got on if you're an excellent teacher? Well, not necessarily, but it's still good to have people in your life that what will compliment you, suit you. I love this verse in Romans 12, 5. It's such a good verse. It speaks to me all the time. For we are parts of one another. The Amplified Bible says this, mutually dependent on one another. No. Listen, I, 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 you, you know, there's always folks who have social issues and and I, I understand that. Uh, and they just have difficulties in crowds. And, 
And, and really, I'm, I'm very empathetic about that. But just to feel like because of, because of you don't want to connect, you don't want to be a part, you don't see the need to be a part of a body of believers, the scripture says this, we are mutually dependent upon one another. Why? Because people feel the deficits in our lives. I'm a guy who needs well-organized people around him. Why? Because I fly by the seat of my pants. And even there, I've improved a little bit over the years, but I need well-organized people around me. I'm mutually dependent upon that. We all need somebody. We need one another. Look at this. Everyone needs someone. Adam needed Eve. Lot needed Abraham. Now remember, who's Abraham? Abraham, he's the father of faith. I mean, it, because of his faith, it was imputed to him. Righteousness. But even Abraham, for the promise of God to be fulfilled, needed Isaac. But Moses, and was he a great leader? Yeah. He saw miracles. He led a nation out. They were delivered. But Moses needed Aaron. You know, Moses not only needed Aaron, but Moses needed judges to help him to, to lead and make decisions concerning the, the people. Joshua, he needed Caleb. Haman needed Esther. And what would have happened to David had there not been a Nathaniel? The paralytic, he needed friends. Remember they tore up the roof and they let him down? Peter needed John, and Paul needed Barnabas, and we need one another. And listen, and Christ needs a church. When I say, now, when I say need, that is not to say that we have a de de deficiency. I say there's a design, a design. In his absence, we are his body. It's design. It was part of God's design, again, for, for Moses to need someone like Aaron. Would you imagine what would happen to our egos if we didn't need anybody? Wouldn't be pretty. Everybody has need in their lives. It's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of God's design. It's the way he created us. I'm not, I won't be exhaustive in Ecclesiastes this morning, but let's turn to Ecclesiastes 4, verses 9, through 12, 9 and 10. Just 9 and 10 today. Now remember it says in Genesis, it says it's not good for man to be alone. Everybody say it's not good. Amen. Say it's not good to be alone. Amen. Say it's good to have help. Amen. Now look what Ecclesiastes says. It says two are what? So God has something good and he also has something better. Now you may be fine by yourself, but he has something better. You may be doing okay by yourself, but he has something better. Two are better than one. Because they have a good return for their work. If one falls, his friend can what? Help him up. But pity the man who falls when he has no one to help him up again. You know, you think about the parable of the Good Samaritan. And it says a certain man was going from Jerusalem to Jericho. And he fell among the thieves. So they stripped him of his raiment, leaving him half dead. Says so the Pharisee passed by, the, the, you know, the lawyer. He passed by, but 
He passed by on the other side. He, he didn't help him. And here come the priest, and likewise said, he passed by also. You know, you've got to have somebody suitable. Not just religious. But then there came a certain Samaritan that says this, and he had compassion on him. Without the Samaritan, he dies on the side of the road. Without the Samaritan. Story of a good Samaritan this week, you know, in a, in a mall where somebody came, came in, started shooting in a food, food court. He comes out of the bathroom and he's, he's, he's carrying and he ends, he ends it. The police chief called him a good Samaritan. He was help. See, in a time of need, we all need what help. The man who fell among the thieves needed what? He needed help. Somebody to come alongside. Again, two are better than one. They have a good reward for their return. His friend will what? Help him. You and I will never become so strong in the faith, so mature in Christ, that you will not have a need. It's never going to happen. If that is your expectation, you will end up being disappointed. You'll never reach that point. Again, we were created to, we were designed to depend upon one another, to connect with one another, to help with one another. If you were looking at the scripture and you would, you would see, and it's ironic, I've got three, three guys and all, their names all start with S, even strong people, and they're all strong. You think about Samson? Yeah. Samson. Hollywood loves Samson. You have Saul. Samson's strong. Saul's a, Saul's a king, he's a general. You have Solomon. Solomon's a king and he's the wisest man we often say that ever lived. You know what they didn't have? Yeah, they didn't have good people in their lives. Samson was called to be a judge in the land of, of Israel. He was called to be a leader, but you don't lead alone. Say that with me. You don't lead alone. One guy, he wrote a book after climbing Mount, 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 Ever, Mount Everest. They said, what did you learn when you got to the top of Mount Everest? He said, there's no one there. Yeah, when you get to the top and there's no one there. That's why you don't lead alone. Samson was an utter failure. He had charisma. He was gifted. He was a Nazarite. He had strength that was unimaginable. He often could defeat his enemies single-handed. He slew a lion with a jawbone. He's powerful. But he was vulnerable. See, needing, needing help is, is this. It's, it's wise. It's a recognition of it. If you don't need it today, just wait. Tomorrow is coming. Against Saul, he stands head and shoulders taller than anybody else in Israel. He's called. He's, he's gifted. He's, he's anointed. But he has nobody to speak into his life. Nobody to tell him this. You're out of control. Solomon didn't have one advisor and say, don't you think you're a little carried away with the concubines here? In all his wisdom, you know, it's not, listen to me, listen. It's not what you know, it's what you apply. Yeah? It's not what you know, it's what you can apply. Solomon knew a lot. 
Solomon is the one who we get the verses there in Ecclesiastes. Two are better than one because they have a good for the reward for their labor. Woe to him who's alone when he falleth, for he not, does not have a friend to help him up again. Again, if two lie together, they have heat. How can one be warm alone? If two prevail against him, three shall withstand him. If one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. A threefold cord is not easily broken. He wrote those words. He knew what to do. He knew what the design was, yet failed to follow the design. Again, even strong people need help. Listen to this about Samson. I did two or three part ser- sermon series about, about Samson several years ago. Sometimes I, I use it to talk about dating with young people, but could use it in other places. I've used it to speak to ministers. But here's one of my thoughts out of that sermon. Samson, Samson was a loner, and Samson did this. Samson traveled alone. Not wise. Samson fought alone. Samson ruled alone. And listen to this. This is sad. Samson died alone. Don't walk alone. Everybody needs help in their lives. Again, this man was gifted. He has charisma. He had a call in his life. His strength was extraordinary. Alone, his weaknesses were overexposed. What did Samson need? He needed somebody. Somebody of like faith in his life. Galatians 6 2 says this Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. What's the law of Christ? It's the will of God, isn't it? And it says, Bear one another's burden. The word bear means this the weight and the load. The weight and the load. See, it's over a period of time. Ray, it's the weeks that turn in the months and the weight. What was it? Somebody, oh, he's going to move Ray's table. That table's heavy. I'm telling you, it's, it's, it takes, takes two grown men to carry it, all right? And uh, it takes two, two big guys. So anyway, I was out here the other day, and, and uh, we, was gonna, we was trying to uh, do the raffle, and we was going to you know, pull, the, pull, pull the winner out. And, and uh, so we, we needed to twist the table just a little bit. And, and, uh, and I've, had a, I've had a little bit of back trouble, and Miss April, she, she always tries to watch out for me, try to keep me from doing something I shouldn't when my wife's not around. And, and so anyway, I'm going to move it. And she says, oh, let me do it. I said, it's fine. I can move it. She says, you know how much that weighs? I said, I'm not carrying it to town. You, you understand? Now, I can move that table a few inches, but it's over time. It's over time. That's why you need friends that will walk with you a long time. You know what I'm saying? For real. Yeah. Friends that will walk with you for a long time. That will stay the course with you. Stay the course. I've been real fortunate to have a lot of people stay the course with me here. Yeah. Me and Miss June, we've stayed the course. You need people to walk with you for a long time because what? Because of the weight. Because of the load. Sometimes it's care. Sometimes it's hurt. Sometimes it's responsibility. Responsibility is not a bad thing. But it's a heavy thing. Responsibility is off, often it can become burdensome on our lives. And this is once again why we're created. It's a design. It's not a design flaw. It is, it's built into the plan. God in his creativity said this. We'll, we'll help them to be able to sustain the long haul. I'll build them where they need one another. He says, bear one another's burdens. 
You need somebody to help with the weight, with the load. And he says, and when you do this, you fulfill the law. You fulfill the, the will of God. You're walking when you're in the love of God. Over the years, I've said this a lot of times. Man's greatest revelation is this, is, is it? He has a need. He has a need. Now, again, somebody could dispute that, and you might feel like something is more important, but I, I often say, unless, unless you understand you're lost, how can you get saved? I need Jesus, don't I? Well, and is anyone in question whether or not that's the greatest revelation? I think not. I need a Savior. I need a deliverer. I need a Lord. Man's greatest revelation is this, is that he has a need in his life. I, I, I rarely pass by a subject like this without saying something about celebrate recovery. For a person to find victory, whether that is over food or codependency or alcohol or drugs, you've got to come to a point in your life you say, I am needy. I am needy. I had a friend years ago. He's, he's up in age now, and he's old enough that his mind's slipping a little bit. But years ago, he, he, he one day, I don't, you know, whatever. I, it's, this is not about condemnation, but for whatever reason, somebody was talking about smoking, and my, my friend Bob said this, I can quit any time I want. And sometimes Bob would quit for... Two or three weeks. Sometimes he'd quit for months. But he'd always pick it back up. And see, in his mind, he didn't have no need. He didn't have a problem. It wasn't affecting him. Now you think about that now, relationship, mind you. That's, that's smoking. That's not the... Nobody going to hell over smoking. You understand? I'm, there, there's lots of habits in life. But now alcohol could destroy you and your family. But I meet people all the time that they're in control. Yeah. We've all met an addict. I, listen, it's not really a problem. Yeah, I know. That's, that's why you lost your license, your job, and your family. Because it's, it's not a problem. Had a guy tell me that one time. I said, I said, listen to me, you're about to lose your family. How could you tell me it's not a problem? He didn't want to admit he had what? A need. Oh, there must be something defective with me. No, you were made that way. You were, need, you were made to lean on somebody, to reach out to somebody. And sometimes we're, we're the ones that, that need to be the ones that are leaned on. It works both ways. Man's greatest revelation is he has a need. See, in life, I've, I, didn't need, I didn't need a handout. I needed a hand up. In life, I, I needed someone's prayer, and I, I didn't need someone's pity. I needed encouragement. See, you, you, you need people in your life that will challenge you. I need somebody who will stand in agreement with me. When I'm talking about standing in agreement in faith. I need someone to listen. Sometimes I've, I've got to have somebody that will go the extra mile with me. The extra mile with me. Because I've got a need. I need somebody to walk the distance with me. I need those who will help me when I'm wounded. Sometimes the church shoots their wounds. 
I need somebody to understand. I don't know about you, but I have times in my life I need somebody to tell me the truth. Leon come to me one time. It's not too bad. It's about me, though. He said, Pastor Bill, he said, you're a good teacher. You're a good preacher. You do a great job. You don't have to preach an hour and a half. <laughs> you remember that? Aren't you grateful? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, there's a lot more things that are more serious in life than that, that you need somebody to be honest with you. You know, if your friend's in trouble, you've, you've got to be able to be honest with them. I need, I need people I can call at midnight. I, I need a community of believers that will stand in the gap. We're talking about need. I need, I need people in my life that are of like, precious faith. See, this is not something we do alone. Let me, let me make a real bold statement. You cannot say, I do not need you. Well, who, 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 you got the nerve? No. I got the scripture. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 12, 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, <clears throat> I don't need you. And the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. Yeah. Look at somebody close to you and say, I need you. Yeah. See, that's a reality. Everybody needs somebody. Everybody needs somebody. I mean, I need my kids. I need my grandkids. I need a church family. We all have what? We all have, we all have need. Need in our lives. Romans 12, 5 says this. We are parts of one another, Remember? Mutually dependent upon one another. See, if I've been wounded and I'm lying on the side of the road, I'm mutually dependent upon somebody coming my way. If I need somebody to stand in the gap for me, I'm, I'm mutually dependent upon someone. If, if, if I need a prayer partner, I'm, I'm mutually Dependent. When life becomes discouraging and I need to be encouraged, I'm mutually dependent upon the encouragement of others. Everybody needs encouragement. You do. We do. We are what parts of one another. We, we take lightly what it means to belong to the body of Christ, to be a part of a family. We are mutually dependent upon one another. We said that this is God's design. It's the way that we're created. Created to, to need people to need others, created to walk alongside people that suit us. I'm glad that they get to suit us. You know, June suits me well. Uh, when I was in high school, I remember when I first saw her, she suited me well. You get it. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that, is there? Yeah. She suits me. But more important, that they compliment us. And then I don't live a life that is unsatisfactory, that is below average, below average. I mean, Patton was a great general, but he had to have a great army. Yeah. 
he's, he's dependent to, upon them. You can, you, can, you can have great buildings to educate our children. But what would that be without leadership and without the people to teach the kids and the staff to support the campus? But what we're mutually dependent upon one another. See, it keeps us from just being just below average, being unsatisfactory. And we said this is what? It's God's design. It's the way we're created. See, God himself exists in, think about this, God exists in the community of the Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now these three are what? And what is the church? We are many members in one body. God exists with, look at at the way he says this in, in, in Genesis, in Genesis 1.26. Now God said, let us make man in our own image and in our likeness. Isn't that interesting? It doesn't say, let me make man in my own image and in my likeness. Let us. Now again, we do believe these three are one. It's the miracle of the Trinity. I was, we were discussing this the other day. I think Jeff and I were having the discussion about a couple things, but we ended up talking about the Trinity to be able to finish the conversation about what we were talking about. You know, not everything is easily understood. We sometimes see, see through a glass, glass darkly. The Trinity is something I accept by faith. All right? I cannot fully explain it. I don't, fully, I don't know how these three are one. I just believe it. The Scripture teaches it. Uh, I'd rather, you know, the closest I can ever come, I've, I've said this, and it's, it's so inadequate. It's so inadequate. You know, you, can, you, can have, you could have fluid in, in multiple f- forms. You know, water can be steam. Water can just be liquid. Or water can be ice. And it's all water. It's all water. Now, that's not, you know, That's a pretty finite attempt. I would even say a weak attempt. I accept it by faith. But God says this, let us, within this community, within this relational trinity, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. So part of being like God is existing and operating in a community. In a community. You know, God sends the Holy Spirit. He he distributes gifts, the Bible says, as He wills. But then there's the Son. In the fullness of time, the Father sent His Son... He took on flesh and he lived among us. John 1.1 1, 1 says that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God. Verse 14 says, and the Word became flesh. It became flesh. You see that community. You have the will of the Father being expressed. You have the Son fulfilling it. You have the Holy Spirit distributing it. The working together, the cooperating together. The universe is held together. Let us make man in our own image. Who are you and I to want to operate outside that community, that design in which God created? Again, David was a great person of faith. He'd have never made it to the throne without a Nathaniel. He was better with him. Without somebody like Nathaniel in his life. And there was others. He had many men around him. And when he didn't have people around him, he got into trouble. 
God said, let us make man in our own image and after our likeness. I will close with this thought. Don't suffer the poverty of, of the loner when you can enjoy the benefits of the body of Christ, which is found in one another. Yeah. You know, the scripture tells me as a pastor says there's, there's wisdom in the multitude of counselors. I always like my ideas. I'm real partial to my opinions. Yeah. I'm like Yogi. I'm smarter than the average bear. I'm grateful for the scripture that sets me straight. Their wisdom in the multitude of counselors. Somebody can see something. Somebody's experienced something. Somebody's already walked there. They've already lived through it. They've gotten to the other side. Loneliness. You can have everything, but if you're alone, you're poor. You're poor. The benefits of belonging to a community, of, of, of being able to enjoy the help. Think about this, help, safety, security. There can be healing. But listen, you can also do this thing here. You can keep everybody at arm's length. And you can go over here and you can. Well, I said, it's not whether or not you believe in God. It's not whether or not you're a Christian. I'm not questioning whether or not somebody's going to heaven. I'm saying the Bible teaches us it's unsatisfactory. It's not good. And then he tells us in Ecclesiastes, I have better. Who wants better? Who wants better? We need better in our lives. Yeah. That's why we need the church. That's why we need one another. That's why we need friends. There are even strong people. People like Samson, Saul, Solomon. They needed somebody in their lives. And you know what they experienced? The poverty of the loner. Solomon, in all his wisdom, he knew what the design was. And he didn't follow it. Listen. You know what Solomon says just before he gets to this point where he says two are better than one. They have a good reward for their labor. I won't do the whole thing. If you go to the beginning of the verse, he says meaningless. Meaningless. Everything's meaningless. He talks about nothing but despair until he gets to talking about another. He was experiencing it. Ecclesiastes means the preacher. This wise preacher Solomon said it's meaningless, meaningless. Everything is meaningless. And he says, let me tell you what's better. It's better not to be alone. He had a thousand wives and concubines, and he was still alone. Think about that. A thousand wives and concubines. Listen, don't, forget the illicit part of it. Forget the immoral part of it. Think about the social part of it, the emotional part of it. He has a palace. He has servants. He's got herds and herdsmen. And he says this, and it's all meaningless. Because he doesn't have a community of believers. Father, I thank you for your word. How good it is. How beneficial it is. Thank you, Father, that we can see this morning that we all need one another. We all have a need for help in our lives. Even your son 
said, I can do nothing by myself. What an example, Lord Jesus. We too, Father, can do nothing by ourselves. Nothing satisfactory. Nothing really meaningful. We need you. We need one another. For just a brief moment, Let me say this before I start with the invitation. You might have a need in your life and you may need another to come alongside you and pray with you. There's going to be prayer partners here at the front as I'm giving an invitation. If you're sick, if you're hurt, if you're struggling, if you're wore out, if you feel like your faith is spent, there's people that will stand here and, and pray believe God with you. I'd further encourage people, if somebody you know comes up this morning and you just feel like supporting them in prayer, I would say do it this morning. We need one another. So as I'm praying, I'm inviting our prayer partners to come right now. Second of all, you might be here this morning and maybe you've never made a decision concerning God's Son, Jesus Christ. We all need a Savior. We all need a Lord in our lives. If you're here this morning and say, Pastor Bill, I'm not certain I've ever accepted Christ in my life. Well, let me ask you a few questions. Can you believe that Jesus Christ is God's own friend? You might say, well, yeah, I can believe that. I've, I've, I, I, don't, I really don't doubt that. Yeah, I believe that Jesus Christ is God's own son. Can you believe that he, that he died on the cross and that he died for you? And you might say, yeah, yeah, I've, I've heard that now. I, I believe he died for me. Do you believe that when he died that he was buried and that he was raised from the dead? And if you say, see, this is essential here. Can you believe that God raised him from the dead? Do you believe in the resurrection? You might say, well, yeah, yeah, I, I celebrate Easter every year. Yeah, I, I believe in the resurrection. Well, let me tell you the one thing you might lack, and you believe a lot of good things. Good for you. That is wonderful. Because you have to be able to believe. But listen to what the Bible says, Romans 10, 9, and 10. If you confess with your mouth, say something with your mouth, and believe in your heart, listen to this, the Lord Jesus you will be saved. This has become one of the most important things to me in giving an invitation is this next statement. To get saved is not just accepting Christ as your Savior, it's accepting Him as the Lord of your life. There is no salvation without Lordship. We're surrendering, we're giving Him everything. Would you make Jesus the Lord of your life? Now, everybody wants to give him their sin and their hurt and their habits. And you should. You must. But he also wants your love, your gifts, your talents, your ability. He wants to be Lord. You give him everything. It's surrendering our lives to his lordship. If we confess with our mouths and believe in our hearts the Lord Jesus, we believe in his lordship over our lives will be saved. See, He loved us enough to die for us. And because of that, we recognize, we reciprocate His love by accepting His Lordship over our lives. And we're saved. Forgiven. Now you might be here and say, Pastor, I've known the Lord, but I've wandered in my faith. Well, will you reaffirm that He's Lord? Will you commit, surrender to Him? Every head bowed, no one looking around. If you're here this morning and say, Pastor Bill, I'm not certain I've ever asked Jesus to come into my life. But this morning, I'm ready. I'm going to call Him Lord. I'm going to become a part of the family of God. I want to be saved. I want to be God's child. I want to be a part of the family of God. 
Second of all, you might be here and you say, Pastor, I, I, I have known the Lord, but I've wandered, and I'm, I, I want to reaffirm my faith this morning. We're inviting you to pray with us. Let's pray together. Say this with me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I believe in your Son, Jesus. I believe that He lived. I believe that He died. I believe He died for me. I believe He was raised from the dead. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Save me. Cleanse me. Forgive me. I accept you now. As my Lord, I give you everything. And I receive you as my Savior. Thank you for saving me now. Thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. For one, just one more brief second, nothing to embarrass anyone. You might be here this morning and say, Pastor Bill, I'm not certain. I'm not certain that I've ever asked Christ to come into my life or two. I've known the Lord, but I've wandered in my faith. And this morning, I've reaffirmed that faith. If that's you, look up real quickly. It's all we want to do. Just look. Give us a moment. Let's wait for our eyes to meet. Thank you. God bless you. Yes. Give us another moment. Just wait for our eyes to meet. Shake your head up and down if you're, if you're acknowledging that. Thank you. Father, you look down from heaven. You see more than our eyes. You see our hearts. You see the decisions and commitments that people make. God, we thank you for so great a salvation. Thank you, Father, for hearing our cry this morning. God, we do. We got a need in our lives. And that need is you. Thank you, Father. Once again, if you've got a need in your life, we've got prayer partners at the front. They're glad to pray with you. Thank you, Father. Worship team's going to lead us in a chorus.